Good morning. Somebody tells me it's, I need to get my act together. Only that clock says it's a minute tell, you see. We'll fix that clock. Thank you very much for joining us for Forum this morning. Um, I see some new faces, so let me tell you there are four of us who organize and do Forum. We've been doing it for about 14 years, every Wednesday morning from 8 to 9. So myself, Barbara Bynum, and then Phoebe Benziger and Kathy Hebers. So program varies. You get an email on Saturday morning that tells you what it's going to be, but who knows what it's going to be. We have lots of varied diversity here, and we love having suggestions. So if you have anything you want, want us to present or talk about, please just let one of us know. This morning, obviously, we're going to be talking about the schooling. Most of you know Matt Jenkins. He's here every week, I think. Um, we were talking earlier. I retired in 2003 from teaching special needs, and that's when Matt came to Montrose County School District to teach special needs. So he stayed in the special needs classroom for quite a while. Did you know that? No. <laughs> and then he went from special needs into administration, and it's done a variety of things like some of us have. Um, he was an English teacher, he was a drama coach, okay, and then he became the public information officer. So that's what he's been doing for three years. And so we want him to give us some public information, right? So please, help me welcome Matt Jenkins. Thank you, Judy for that wonderful introduction. And thank you for being here this morning. Um, for our agenda, do a brief introduction uh, of myself and uh, another person that's gonna be talking also. Um, for today, we're gonna be talking about new school program and new-ish programming that's been around for uh, about a year or two, but not a lot of folks know about. Um, and those include our Outer Range Campus for Outdoor Learning, uh, Peak Academy, which has been around for a while, but uh, there's been some slight changes to that programming. And then our new alternative school, Black Kenyon High School, Angelique Chavez is here, who's the principal of that program, and is going to speak about it um, as well. And then at the end, we'll make sure to save some time to do question and answer. So, um, relative to Judy Ann's introduction to me, I'm the public information officer. Um, my responsibilities include communications, I'm the press liaison, I do crisis communications, social media, I do some grant writing, multimedia, and then I'm the district spokesperson. Um, I used to teach at Montrose High School, as Judy Ann said, uh, and then I became a district coordinator doing um, some special education and family navigation. Um, when COVID hit, um, our previous superintendent, Mr. Scheel, um, said, you know, we're gonna need to get some communications because we're gonna have a ton of crisis communications going out. And so my, my uh, the communications department at the school district and my position came back as a result of COVID. Um, and, and we're gonna continue uh, with that department with my position, hopefully. Uh, my undergraduate degrees are in business and English and I have a graduate, graduate degree in media studies. Um, this is my 18th year as an educator and I've spent 13 years here in Montrose County. Um, Folks um, wonder what a PIO does or, or what school communications looks like. Um, and another PIO job opened here in town. And somebody said, well, what does that mean to be a PIO? And I said, really, it means three things. To be a PIO, number one, you gotta have some pretty good knowledge of your systems. Uh, and so having spent 13 years with the district, I do have a pretty good idea of our campuses, of how our systems work. The second thing is, you need to be a decent oral and written communicator because uh, that's what you're gonna be doing is talking and writing and, and doing maybe some filmmaking. And then the last thing is you just need to share your organization's core value or mission. Um, and I'm a fifth generation uh, educator. My uh, great, great grandfather taught in a one room schoolhouse in Chicago, Illinois. My great grandmother was a teacher. My grandmother was a counselor and teacher and my mom and dad were uh, teachers, librarians. And, school administrators, and so it's kind of in my bloodstream, but I certainly share the core mission of our organization, which is helping kids. It's something you can feel good about, uh, and, and something that, that I think means something, and will have a lasting impact on your community. So um, the first new-ish program I'm gonna talk about is Outer Range. 
This, I did not prepare this section of the slide deck. Uh, this is from an April family information meeting that Keely Vaughn, <coughs> excuse me, Keely Vaughn, who's the principal of Outer Range, and Kirsten Brown, who's a coordinator for Outer Range, they prepared this slide for parents who were interested in sending their kids to Outer Range. And so it's gonna provide, it's gonna provide some good information on what that program looks like. As I was going through it, it was pretty slide heavy. So every three or four slides, I put in some cute pictures of kids at Outer Range having fun. <laughs> so if you get bored, within about three or four slides, we'll see some cute kids doing fun stuff. Um, so to begin with, this is one of my favorite pictures from Outer Range. Um, they call this tree here the sleeping tree. And the Outer Range campus is connected to the district office campus. If you've been uh, to district office or have some knowledge of where that's at, um, if you turn off of Rio Grande trying to go to River Bottom, you turn left. Instead of turning left, you turn right. That's where district office, the early childhood center campus is. Um, when Dr. Carrie Stevenson, our superintendent who is now in her third year with the district, um, when she got here, she noticed a couple of places we could innovate. Um, and so everything I talk about today is grounded in our foundation, our strategic plan, which you can find on our website in csd.org. Um, and one of the priorities of the strategic plan is meeting the needs of all students. Um, not just the top 15% of our students, um, you know, not just a certain group of students, all of our students' needs are gonna be met. So we have to provide programming that is very and differentiated uh, to meet every student's need. So Dr. Stevenson said one, one area that we could improve, and there's gonna be uh, some information on the slides in here, is outdoor learning. We live in a beautiful part of the country. Like kids can be outside learning. Um, and, and so that's really the mission and spirit of, of this campus. And then also post-pandemic, folks wanna be outside. We don't wanna be stuck inside. Um, so this is the learning tree. The outer range campus that is attached to district office, there was a bunch of unused land that we weren't doing anything with. Um, and now we've got three teepees and two yurts, which make up the Yurter Garden and make up uh, the Alpine Star uh, Preschool that I'm gonna talk about. Here's one of our yurts. Um, here is our teepees here, and then this is a night shot of uh, the campus. So this is on kind of the north side of district office, and actually the way these pictures are arranged is pretty similar to campus. You got your teepees here, you got your yurts here, and then like over here is the river. Um, which we can also take advantage of as a learning space. So one big question that we often get with Outer Range, which is an outdoor kindergarten and outdoor preschool is, but what if? They say, well, what if it rains? Well, they're gonna get rained on. <laughs> and these are folks that like being outside. So they said, well, but what if it snows? We live in Colorado. Well, they're gonna get snowed on and they're gonna have fun out in the snow. And so this campus, you know, really caters to families and children that like to be outside, that like to be learning, that like to be getting dirty. Um, I don't know, I wouldn't have been an out, out of range kid because I like to be inside. Uh, and I'm from Tennessee, so I get pretty cold. Um, but I, I, you know, the question, what if, it's an outdoor learning campus and so you're gonna have fun outdoor learning, you're gonna get bundled up and, and that's what's gonna happen. So when it snows, you're gonna have kids having fun out in the snow. This is our grand opening from last year. Uh, that was a rainy, cold day. You can see folks that are all bundled up. Um, I was there in a big orange parka because I was cold. Um, but, you know, it, it's about being outside. So, some of the content, the, the core mission for Outer Range, they're talking about creative action to respond to dynamic needs, again, of all students. Um, you know, young people deserve to be radically seen and share power in their education. And transformation is a part of the natural rhythm. Um, you know, there, there's a rhythm to nature, and, and they try to mirror that in outer range. So here are some of the kind of watchwords for what school and learning should be. Hopefully, we've all had some experience with one or more of those words. Uh, learning should be joyful, you know, challenging, playful. Uh, should be a shared experience, and certainly should be relevant. Um, so some of the reasons that the outer range campus exists. Their mission statement is joyful, shared experiences created to awaken and inspire. Guided by the embrace of the unknown, they try to unravel and, and transform the mystery of nature, moving beyond the ordinary and also partnerships. We're gonna talk a lot about partnerships 
in subsequent slides. So here's a, hopefully a distracting uh, slide that's got some cute kids. I love a young lady's expression. Um, you got some kids just kind of exploring, and you know that, that a big part of being a kid is exploration. So having a natural learning space to do that is a really cool thing. So the genesis of Outer Range really was a response to community feedback. Um, if you remember in 2020, um, you know, Superintendent Stevenson did a lot of outreach, gathering information. A big priority in the feedback we got was outdoor learning and getting kids outside and off devices. Um, we want to increase options for the educational path of their students. And again, engage, engaging families post-pandemic is huge. Like one of the big things we found in education coming out of uh, COVID-19 is families we're, we're stuck at home, they want to get back in school, and we need to re-engage them. So all of, some of the different partners uh, include families and students, uh, Early Childhood Health Outdoors, uh, Colorado Department of Early Childhood, Bright Futures Early Childhood Council, Energize Colorado, and Friends of Youth and Nature. So if you're not familiar with what our preschool programming looks like in Montrose County, we have four campuses now. Our main campus is at district office, that's the traditional uh, Montrose preschool. Um, got a lot of modulars there. Um, in Olathe, we have a smaller campus, and in Johnson, we have a smaller campus. Those are attached to Olathe Elementary and Johnson Elementary School. And then now we have the Alpine Star Program. Um, so three <laughs> kind of core components of the program model, curriculum, instruction, and assessment. Curriculum for outer range. Uh, deals with the flow of learning and you know within that is student experiences and growth that is standards based instruction as is all of our learning environments um, it's responsive to kids supported with research and experience and then driven by inquiry and play getting outside uh, so what do we want students to learn feel and do the colorado state standards and early and learning development guidelines are a foundation for what our students are learning, what our teachers are teaching. We've got integrated project design that has three components, direct instruction with a traditional teacher doing a sit and get. We've got small group support where different student groups are working on different content with support from staff, and then also personalized goals. Um, other cool features of the programming, you know, you're immersed in nature, you're outside learning. You can also do offsite excursions, which I'm gonna talk about and show, show you some pictures on and then just a focus on growth and progression. I took this slide from Canva into PowerPoint, so the formatting's a little wonky, so I apologize. But part of the assessment um, piece for our range is that it's balanced and meaningful, timely and relevant. You've got standardized assessments. We can also do daily observations and conversation. We're looking at the whole child here. Um, we have formative assessments, which are traditional assessments for teaching strategies summative and perceived risk continuum. Keely Vaughn, who is the principal of this school program, really talks a lot about risk in an interesting way, and that, you know, culturally, certainly for some of our families, they're so risk averse that they don't even want to go outside to play. And, and, you know, part of being a kid is climbing trees and doing stuff that has a little bit of risk, and uh, stubbing your toe and, and getting your knees scuffed up a little bit. Uh, and, and you can do that outside if you do it on a, a perceived risk continuum, do it in a safe way. Um, a little more on the instruction, you know, it, it includes play, includes community involvement and contribution. Um, the play piece has an emergent approach where you're learning as you're playing. Um, the community piece, you know, well-being through interdependence, we can work together and independently. And then when you're outside, you get a good sense of purpose. Uh, another part of outer range is the timberline coalition so for like a classroom traditional we've got uh, pre-k at alpine start we've got the yerba garden kindergarten that i'm going to talk about but then we also have an elective for high schoolers that they can get engaged in some outdoor learning uh, this is a student who is an avid fisherman that's at uh, the timberline coalition so they built some um, curriculum and some learning units around fly fishing and he and his buddies and the teacher will go out and they'll learn about biology through fly fishing. Uh, the campus is over right near river bottom so they can just walk down and, and catch some fish like he's 
uh, caught there. And, and as a, a fisherman myself, I thought, man, that's really cool. If I had been in junior, a junior, senior in high school and could have taken like a fly fishing elective that had biology and nature and insects and herbology, like that would have been a cool thing. So that's a really neat opportunity for our high schoolers. Um, you know, one of the phrases that the outer range staff use are there no two days are alike, but they do have a rhythm. And again, that goes back to, um, you know, nature and, and being outside. You know, having a structure for the day that helps teacher and student to know what to expect. You know, they have a rhythm that balances independent group times and teacher-led and student-directed activities. Um, you know, for the preschool, some of the guiding um, rhythms of the day, they've got chores, circles, play, and snack. Um, you can see what you know that's kind of made up for. As a, a as a pre-K preschooler, you, you know you're starting to learn what school's going to look like, so you need to have responsibility for things. Um, you know, in circles, we can talk about social norms. We can listen to each other, um, and again, it's just kind of learning what school's going to be. Outer range is a little different. Another phrase they use is kind of less beeline, less all getting a line and more of a slither. And, and kids are kind of figuring out a path, you know, with some teacher instruction and, and uh, observation. And then, you know, the snack piece, they're, they're strengthening their motor skills, numeracy, casual reasoning, all those uh, kind of higher order thinking that goes into when we start school. Um, they do a lot of project-based learning, uh, prolonged attention and continuity. Uh, work on the vocabularies, their feelings of place, and direct instruction. Um, you know, lunch, they, they have common spaces throughout campus. Um, they're building cognitive sequencing, listening, phonemic awareness, um, all those important skills for preschool that's going to lead into kindergarten. And then, of course, rest and nap time. You've got to uh, focus on memory consolidation, resourcefulness, and self sufficiency. Um, <clears throat> So that is for the pre-K um, early childhood program, Alpine Start. We now have a class of kindergartners that uh, are learning out of the Yerger Garden, and this is the first year for that program. Um, you can take a look at some of the activities for Yerger Garden. Uh, it's not unlike the preschool programming. It's mapped out in a pretty specific way each day to leave some freedom and autonomy for outdoor learning. Uh, I'm gonna kind of skip through here. So here's uh, two of our kids at Yerger Garden. Again, you like to get dirty, learning outside, um, and there are several paths on campus that um, are pretty neat that the kids are walking. So, you know, obvious question is, how are we paying for this? How are we going to sustain this? So initially the funding um, was a mix of grants, uh, tuition structure and educational pathways that I'm going to talk more about. Some of the grants include Buell, the Gates Foundation, the Woods Next Fund, AmeriCorps Vista. Um, we, can also use, we also use title funds to start this program and to move it forward. Um, the Forest Service has provided some financial assistance. And then a big uh, part of the birth of our outdoor learning were, were ESSER funds, the COVID relief funds. The way that we're going to sustain this moving forward, the preschool very likely is going to continue to be a tuition-based program, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about that on a subsequent slide. And then the Yerger Garden will be through uh, per pupil funding. So for Alpine Start, uh, we had to look at the cost of providing a high-quality preschool program, but also think about affordability for families of varying incomes, because we're again going to offer this to all students to meet all student needs. And then we have to equitably compensate our teachers. So here's the current rate for Alpine Start. Um, uh, the half day programming is $40. The full day programming is $45 a day. Um, and we also have some options for state funding assistance for uh, families with qualifying uh, economic or, or eligibility. And then that talks about when payments are due. Um, again, Yerger Garden is funded through PPR per pupil funding. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that uh, later on. So this is what the staffing looks like for our range uh, for the 22-23 school year, which is this school year. Um, Keeley and Kirsten are the uh, leadership for that program. Uh, there's a lead preschool teacher that has 15 students plus a paraprofessional. 
There is a part-time early childhood classified teacher with a paraprofessional that is serving 15 students, and then a full-time ECC classified teacher plus a paraprofessional for 15 students, and that makes 45 Alpine Start kids in our preschool program. And then there are 20 kids in the Yurter Garden, they call them Yurties, um, and then the Timberline Coalition that I talked about is 12 to 15 part-time high school students doing an elective uh, for three hours every other day. And then here's some more cute uh, kid pictures. Uh, kid found a bug. I thought that uh, facial expression was pretty cute. And uh, we got some donated outdoor furniture, which are, of course, logs. <laughs> um, and, and so, Again, we need to be looking towards sustainability because we don't want this to be a one and done. Um, you know, our long term goal is that we can have a, a campus that would be pre K through 12. Um, the idea is if the preschool kids really dig this outdoor learning, then they can transition to kindergarten, which we have those two classes. If our kindergarten class parents say yeah we want to keep doing this then we could build a first grade class and then just build through the course of one cohort's educational career uh, which is a really exciting thing uh, and so what we're thinking in what that pk 12 program would look like is around 50 percent project-based learning that would have integrated content of course be standards based and you'd be working on skills and then you know, 20% focus, which would be more direct instruction, 20% field work, uh, where you've got specific field work projects that be differentiated. You'd have some of that direct instruction, but also the outdoor experience. And then 10% play that's, you know, trail walking and community and expeditions and kind of shared responsibility of what you need to know to, to be outside uh, doing stuff. So this is from April. We've made some progress since then, of course. Um, the phases of development over the summer, you know, we finished up cleanup, uh, landscaping and fencing. If you haven't been down to district office, we've got, you know, some fencing up for those uh, little kiddos running around in the brush uh, to make sure they're safe. Um, everything's got to be ADA accessible, which it is. Um, and <coughs> we've really taken some undeveloped land and um, gotten some real good utility out of it. Um, this summer, we should have almost all of our structures up, working on some power line removal uh, and finishing up the landscaping. Um, you know, back to that what if slide, we do have heating and cooling in these yurts. Um, and, you know, I asked Keely yesterday, I said, well, you know, does it get too cold? She said, no, I think it's fine. Uh, but I think her metric for too cold in mine may be a little different, but, uh, <laughs> and, you know, the kids are still having fun and I think they're doing great. Um, some logistics, things we got to think about. Um, parents provide transportation to Yurta Garden and the preschool. Uh, we're looking at how we might get creative to support each other with the transportation barrier. Um, we're currently assessing the need for before and after school care. Uh, and then we're also collaborating on what lunch and breakfast looks like for these students. Um, we're working with nutritional services for kind of sack lunch deal, but that, that's an area that we could grow. So if you have any questions about um, Outer Range, here is their contact information, uh, or I can connect you with them. My contact information is going to be on the very last slide. Um, but that was a lot of talking about Outer Range. And we'll take, I'll take questions at the end. I'm going to do like four slides on peak, and then Angelique, I'll get you to come up here and talk, because I've been doing too much talking. <laughs> uh, so Peak Academy is one of our 14 campuses. This is another new-ish um, program. It's not like the original peak's not super new because you can see up there it started in 2011 uh, as a, an online only model. Um, that only had a few students because if you think back, uh, you know, 11-ish years ago, um, the concept of 100% of online uh, was a lot different than it is now. That was expanded to Peak Virtual Academy. Currently, that programming provides a hybrid K-12 experience, and then also an online model for grades three through 12. Uh, you can see the mission for PEAK here is to be innovative, uh, personalized, and, and provide rigorous learning. Uh, learning is a constant, <clears throat> and the time and place are the variables. So 
This is less alternative than hybrid. I would probably use the word hybrid for this. Um, as a hybrid school, you know, it's blended learning both in person and online. So a student needs to be able to do both of those. Um, it's got a small school feel, a strong sense of community. And um, when students graduate from Peak, we know that they'll become lifelong learner, learners who are career and college ready. So the staff make up for Peak Academy. They have 18 teachers, one counselor, a principal, and a student engagement coordinator. Um, they've outgrown their space. So at mcsd.org, where you can find our strategic plan, you'll also find our master capital plan uh, that took us a little over two years uh, to complete and is a really solid document for you know what our deferred maintenance looks like you know where we're where we need to you know lead our focus part of the top 10 suggestions was peak is too small and, and or rather the peak campus is uh kind of busting at the seams and um that's a campus that's growing so it's just something that needs to be on our radar uh the main campus is their uh, grades three through 12 hybrid um, the Pomona Annex has their uh, K kindergarten through third grade hybrid, so they're kind of spread out. As a result of outgrowing that space, we're having to kind of fit folks places. Um, there's also a cohort on the Columbine campus that is where the grade six through 12 online teachers are serving those kids and uh, occasionally meeting them in person. And then Johnson has the third grade through fifth grade online uh, teachers and, and student check-in. So the student enrollment, uh, we have students in grades kindergarten through 12 or age 21 for special education students. They age out of special education services at age 21. 216 kids are currently enrolled. Uh, again, as with um, our outer range campus, parents provide transportation to and from peak. Uh, and then elective, electives, activities, and athletics uh, can be due through boundary campuses. So if you're a peak student, but you also want to be in band or choir or play football, you can do that at Montrose High School or Centennial or Columbine Middle School. So if you have peak questions, um, Principal Sherry Dros Chacon can be contacted at um, that email address or phone number. And um, at this time, I'm going to ask Ms. Angelique Chavez to come up. And I'll take a break from talking. And so you gotta hold this thing like right next to you. Good morning, thanks for having me today. Like Matt said, my name is Angelique Chavez and I'm the principal at Black Canyon High School. Um, I've been working in the district for a, for a while. Um, I am in about 19 years of education. Half of that time has been an alternative setting and half of that time has been in traditional setting. So I've had both worlds of working with at-risk youth at an alternative school and also in the traditional setting where we still have at-risk youth. When you use the word at-risk, for me, it's at-risk of not graduating. Um, so that's what I associate with. If they're at-risk of not graduating, that means they have some kind of need that's not being fulfilled or met. And so how can we, as a community, make sure that we are supporting those needs? So one way that we're able to do that here is by opening an alternative high school. Um, Black Canyon is for 9th through 12th grade, so any high schooler can attend. Um, it's a choice school, so students can come no matter where they're coming from. I currently have students from live in Olathe, live in Montrose, they come to Black Canyon High School. My campus is right on Montrose High School's campus. I have a small building. If you've been here for a while, it's the old admin building. Um, we've done some renovation to it to make sure that it can fit our students. Um, and meet the needs um, this year. I have been working with engagement centers in the district um, for about three, four years. This is my fourth year. And engagement centers are kind of a school within a school idea. How do we support our students who are in traditional settings who aren't getting their needs met? And so I've been working with sixth through eighth graders and ninth and tenth graders for the last four years. And what we've seen is our students, we have a population of our students that are struggling. They're struggling in whether it's academics, behavior, attendance, social emotional, trauma. Um, and so we wanna make sure we give them a little bit more one-on-one -on -one support. Um, so these engagement centers are in all of our secondary schools. Um, and it's a small environment where students can get support. And that's where the need for an alternative school for ninth and 10th graders especially came. Um, in our district, we didn't have anything for a 14 year old high schooler to get an alternative approach. 
And so this is kind of where that's built from, seeing the need in the last um, few years. And not just post-pandemic, we've gathered information pre-pandemic and our numbers were rising with students um, needing to address some attendance issue behaviors and um, academic issues. Um, the mission here is you know, really to provide the opportunity for kiddos who are not uh, being successful in the traditional setting. Um, what can we do differently? We know that one-on-one -on -one in small environments help when there's a high need. When you have 20 students who all have super high needs, it's hard to place those students in classes of 30, 35. Um, they need something different. Many times students show up and they're hungry. They have had a fight in the, in the morning with a parent. Um, they have these really large needs, and so academics, many times, their brain isn't ready to learn. We have to kind of look at the whole child, and that is our goal at Black Canyon, is making sure our physical needs are met, our emotional needs, and then we can engage them in that academic piece. And so really putting into these students and giving them the skills to break the cycles of poverty, trauma, um, and those kind of things that they come across. Oh, sorry, that, did, that does not look like what I sent. I apologize. <laughs> um, our graduation requirement is different from the traditional setting schools. Um, I did some research, and as we know with alternative schools, um, we were able to change, get board approval. Um, graduation at Black Canyon High School is 21 credits, and the only change I took from our traditional setting at Montrose High School or Olathe High School is I took off electives. Um, 65% of my students right now currently are working. So a lot of our students are trying to come to school and go to work. And so I wanted to honor the work piece for them. And so I took three credits off of electives. If you go to the traditional school and you are on track, your senior year you have a pretty light load, right? You get to take a few classes and be done. And so for students who have maybe some odds against them or need to be out in the working community, I did want another year of high school to hold them back. We want to give them those real world experiences. So we want to make sure that we're getting them training, getting them connected with the workforce. Um, that part is really important to us. And so the only difference from an MHS diploma um, in a Black Canyon high school is it's three less elective credits. Um, so I wanted to let you know what the major different ones. And it's side by side so you can see as we talked about that social emotional learning piece is really important, it's about the whole student and so students get that on a daily. Um, and so that's part of our requirement, work or service. So if students don't have a job, then we provide them with a service so that they can learn those skills on how to get a job, have work ethic, dedication, be able to show up on time, those things that are important. And then post-secondary, we wanna make sure that we provide them with what are they gonna do next? Um, we really want to connect students to Montrose. Um, what I've learned from my experience of Alternative is a lot of times our students do not leave Montrose. They stay here. Their ties are here. Their families are here. So how can we see, show them that they can be successful in Montrose? How can they see all of you doing amazing things and make that connection that they can stay in Montrose and be successful and have a career? We need plumbers, we need electricians, we need people to work at the city, at the county. And so that's the connection, is we want these students to know that they can remain in Montrose and live a really successful life, giving back to our community. And so that's part of that post-secondary piece that we want to make sure that they can get here in Montrose. Um, staffing, I'm the principal. Um, I run Black Canyon High School. I also uh, run the engagement centers I spoke about earlier. I still have that, and so I have a connection to our middle schoolers um, in our district and provide them with things. I also run a district-wide behavior program for elementary. Um, I also, it's called SWE, which is Student Wellness and Engagement. We provide school-based therapists and social workers for the district, and that's under my umbrella um, through Black Canyon as well. My staff, I have a secretary, um, teachers. I have three positions, currently only have two filled. Um, so if you know a teacher, um, <laughs> I am working on that. I actually have done some teaching, which I really enjoy um, and filling that. But, um, and then I also have hired a full-time workforce advisor. Um, so like I said, that connection to community and to working um, is important. Um, my staff, it's really important for me to have the right people, um, connections, understanding trauma, knowing how to read a student, 
um, knowing how not to escalate. Our students come usually to school right here. And so sometimes when you have a full class of 30 and you ask the kid, why don't you have the pencil? It's not about the pencil, it's because the kid doesn't have much to give. Um, and so being able to recognize that. So all of my staff, we've gone through training. Um, we're doing you know, trauma-informed and trauma-skilled, making sure that we understand poverty, emotional poverty and physical poverty, the cycle of it, and how to really understand the perspective of our students. We cannot come from our lens. We have to make sure that we understand where our students' lens is viewing the world, and then we're able to serve them better. Um, do we have a 10 Black Canyon High School? You just have to call. Every family sets up a meeting with me. I meet with every family individually before they start. I think it's really important to understand why they need the change, where they're coming from, and what the needs are. And so that's something that I want to continue to do as I grow. It will get harder, <laughs> but I want to challenge myself to really sit and give families time. I want them to be able to express whether it's a frustration or a need. Um, that's really important so that we, get, we can start off on the right foot and I understand what's not working for them and how can we um, support them in that area. So they just call our school, we set up an appointment, I meet with them individually, um, go over all of those things, tell them and also explain the vision, the mission of Black Canyon, which is real world learning. That's the mission and vision. How can I give our students real world learning experiences so that they can go out and be successful? When they sit in classes, they wanna know why. Why do I need to know the area of a circle? Why do I need to know what a prism is? How will I apply this? And so the math we're doing in our school is real world, budgeting, cooking, construction, baking. All of those things I wanna teach our students is where does math happen in your real life? And how do we learn that and take it to our next step? Um, one of the exciting things that we've done this year thus far, um, I just wanted to highlight this one thing. We've done a few things, but um, we really turn the table on parent-teacher conferences. Um, if you've been in this community, you know parent-teacher conference is twice a year. You have to come to us, and we just kind of do it the same every year. Um, I wanted it to look different. So we did not ask our parents to come to us. We decided to go to our parents. Um, we got donations, and we were able to make 60 mills, homemade mills. Um, I made enchiladas um, and <laughs> pasta, salad, and bread. And we made 60 homemade mills and delivered them to our families. We want school to feel different. We want the connection to be there, and that's so important for us. Many of our families, Feel, can feel a little disconnected from our schools or feel embarrassed to walk into a front door because they weren't good at school. Whatever it might be, there's a lot of perception. And so we want to break those walls down, and I can tell you that it was a hit. Our families were thankful, appreciative. Um, we sat with a few families and actually had dinner with them. Um, a few, we had our students do a reflection, how first quarter went for them, um, what they needed from home to be supported, and so each student filled that out, and when we went to the home, we were able to sit for 10, 15 minutes. Um, some lasted a little longer, um, but it was being in homes, and it was great to see they welcomed us in, um, and it was 60 families. Wasn't everyone, but that was a really good start for us, and so our goal is we will continue to do home visits are a part of my philosophy. We will be in homes throughout the year, um, but this was one way that we could really change what it looked like. And so I was really excited to do that and had a lot of positive feedback um, after. And parents are asking when we're coming back and being pretty appreciative. So um, current enrollments. Currently, I have 124 students enrolled. Um, when I started, my goal last year, we talked about, you know, if you start this, what do you think you have? What do you think you think, you know, how many students do you think there's out there? I've worked with, like I said, all the engagement centers from sixth grade to 10th grade. That's kind of been my zone. And I said, I think I can get 80 students. I think there's 80 students in what I've been working with that can definitely come. So I think that um, 124 shows that the need is there. And going back to what Matt said as a district, all students. There, there are plenty of students who need something different. There are plenty of students that we can give options to. And so this is just one more option. This isn't in place of anything. We have students 
and I think the need is getting higher, and so we, it's an opportunity for them to see something different, um, and so I'm excited to have that 124. Um, we will do have a waiting list as well. Um, I take students in by two-week cycles, so they're able to come in all the time. Um, I wanna make sure students are in school. I find that when a student is struggling and stops going to a school, if they're not anywhere, it's harder for them to come back. And so I really wanna make sure that that gap isn't there, and so that's something I'm working on um, with space to get them in. And that is my contact information, um, the school number, and then my email as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Angel. Angel, um, we only have two more slides. I, I really, you know, it resonated with me what Angelique just said that we want school to be different. Um, you know, school it can't be the same as it was ten years ago, or thirty years ago, or fifty years ago, uh, for a couple of different reasons. One, you know, innovation and technology. We're getting kids ready for careers that don't even exist yet, and, and so. We have to innovate also. And then, you know, the, the traditional one size fits all brick and mortar approach um, just doesn't meet the needs of all students. And so we have to di differentiate our programming. And, and you know, that's, that's a big part of what we've been talking about today um, is the new and newish programming. So actually, this is our last slide. This is my contact information. Um, they make us go by our first name. My first name is Thomas, uh, but I go by Matt, which is my middle name. And then for the school district, everybody's email is first name, dot last name at mcsd.org. I want to put a, a plug in again. Um, please visit our homepage, mcsd.org. You can see our strategic plan. You can see our master capital plan. You can see what home pages for all of the programming that we've talked about today. Uh, and you can really dig in and see some more information and pictures. Um, and I think with that, we're going to finish up a little bit early and have plenty of time for questions and answers uh, for right. myself or Andrew. Right. Judy. Thank you. Questions? Remember, you have to use the mic, so I'll bring you the mic. Hi, I'm Dr. Lauren Harwardell, and I'm here representing the Montrose Mayor. And my specialty when I'm not doing freelance writing, and even when I am, is outdoor education stuff of all kinds. And this is so exciting. I'm really impressed with everything I'm hearing. Now my question for Ms. Chavez is, Ms. Chavez, is for some of the at-risk youth that are there specifically for to do school differently, how much of how they're able to do school differently kind of overlaps with outer range philosophies and goals and outcomes? Do they ever get any time out doors or are they too busy doing other things catching up trying to uh, you know like ad adhere to certain standards and whatnot yeah that's a great question i appreciate that so at that registration meeting one of the things we do is everyone signs a permission slip our goal is to be outside the building as much as possible and so we have taken some walking full trucks um, we did a government lesson and so we actually walked through montrose to see all of the montrose government buildings and so the outdoor piece or the connection piece to Montrose is that vision. And so we wanna make sure that they're seeing, when we talk about government, for a lot of people it's a little far removed. They don't understand what that looks like. And so we wanna make sure we connect that. So yes, being outside of the classroom is very important for us and connecting them to Montrose. Um, the physical part is also a really great part for the social emotional piece as we know. So yes, hiking, being outdoors, being at river bottom and access, accessing the outdoors is um, part of our philosophy as well. Yes, they, <laughs> yes, again, the history of Montrose is important. So yes, our students were really intrigued about Butch Cassidy and so they were able to go down and tour that and then come back to the classroom and apply it. Um, one of the philosophies is we want to flip the learning. And when I say flip the learning, we want them to see first and then come back and learn about it. So that's what we did with the government buildings. Let's go see what Montrose has in the government world and then come back and understand what that looks like. So being able to see it first a lot of times gives more of an impression than being in a classroom trying to learn about it and not have the connection. Exactly. Yeah. I thought that was cool. I didn't know Butch Cassie was in jail in Montrose, so I thought it was pretty cool. <laughs> uh, Angelique, uh, <clears throat> I really uh, 
I really like, I think you really hit on something as far as the uh, at home conferencing with, uh, with the parents and the student. I think it gives you an opportunity to um, uh, teach the parents how to parent, which I think is really you know, probably one of the most critical things that uh, you know, teachers and educators are, are facing. You know, how do you get involved? And I think the last uh, school board election, you know, we had a lot, of, a lot of folks who say, well, we need to have more parent involvement. Well, that's the low-hanging fruit. And, uh, and the real difficult ones are the ones that you're, that, that you're dealing with. So, um, you know, congratulations on that program. And I think it'd be, I'd like to see it, you know, go to the uh, traditional school as well. Uh, Matt, what, um, <clears throat> one of the things I was concerned about or uh, wanted to get more information about, you, you have a lot of information here. Um, how do you uh, interface with, uh, you know, the overall education program in the community with uh, when you take into consideration Maslow and Vista Charter School? Um, I mean, that's a great question. I would say, you know, we want our core mission, back to that phrase, core mission, core value, is for students to be successful. And so wherever, you know, a student's going to be successful, we encourage them to, you know, pursue their educational success, you know, whether it's with us, whether it's with Maslow, um, you know, as a community, we need students that are educated and ready to join the workforce or to um, pursue a college or university career. Um, you know, I, I think if there's a theme today, it's that, you know, more opportunities for our kids is a good thing. Um, more opportunity for our families is a good thing. Um, in 2022, um, the needs of our community are different than 2000, uh, 1980, and 1960. Um, and, and you know, we're a growing community, and so we, we prioritize and value an educated um, population. And so however that's gonna happen, we support. Um, and, and we're a small town, we all work together. Um, and, you know, it's not up here, but um, Jim Pavlich is here, uh, presented a couple of weeks ago or a month or two ago about school security and, and threat assessment and, and suicide risk. and. Part of the thing for that is we're a small town. We're, we're a closely knit community. Um, you know, we know each other and we care about each other. And so, however, students can be successful, we support them. So, is there special formal uh, meetings or anything else with Maslow? Uh, well, yeah, we meet pretty routinely. Um, you know, historically, um, with this charter, we've been a, a kind of a financial pass through. Uh, they have their own board, we have our own board, um, but inevitably we're in the same business and so you know we're going to connect on, on different things in different areas. Um, like I said, school safety is one of those, no matter where you go to school you need to be safe. Uh, so that's one clear partnership and connection we have. And then you know there's a range and, and many others. Mr. Pavlich is raising his hand. I bet Judy Ann would uh, give Mr. Pavlich a microphone so that uh, the whole room could hear it. Yeah, I, I think this is here today, yeah. and the bottom line is there's there's a need for all of it in town. Uh, we're, we have alternative schools in town when you're talking about Maslow, when you're talking about Vista, and we're there's enough kids to support all these programs. You know, we, we're losing kids every year um, to drop out, and so basically we want to give them as many options as possible. And... Uh, to, to get their education. So these aren't in competition, they should be complementing each other and we should be providing enough options that uh, a kid can get educated here in town. And Mr. Thank Pavlich you. said that in about two sentences a lot better than I did. So thank you, Mr. Pavlich. <laughs> okay, another question. My question relates to how the students interact with each other from the various campuses, in essence, and what you do to promote that interaction. Yeah, that's a great question. So one of the things we just recently did, um, Montrose High School has homecoming dance, and that's a big deal for students. My campus is small, so a homecoming dance wasn't gonna happen. And so we were, our students were allowed to go to Montrose High School's homecoming dance. So we're peak students. And so other students are allowed to be in their social settings because that piece is important. And so we really have a working relationship. Um, a lot, a few, quite a few of my students who want to be a part of ROTC, um, I have a student doing some cheer, football, they're allowed to do both. And so that's that piece, if they want to do it, they get the supports they need with the academics. 
and then they can be successful at some of those other things where they're connecting with students from the traditional setting as well. And I would add to that, in regard to the outer range outdoor learning, we're really working hard to integrate those activities and that campus as an opportunity for all of our 14 schools to engage. Um, and, and so part of that's communication, part of that is internal understanding of what's available to teachers to factor into their lesser, lesson and unit planning um, and just getting the word out. And we're making progress, I think, every month with more and more schools taking advantage of the outdoor learning resources we have and we're expanding. Um, and then I think the second part is just engagement. Um, you know, we're, we're trying to, um, you know, really firm up our culture of engagement, uh, be interested, be passionate about what you're working on. Um, you know, in, in addition to uh, getting some skills and, and ready to work or ready to um, start a, a college and university career, we're joining the workforce. Good question. Any more questions? Okay, Becky, I'm coming. <laughs> <laughs> um, several times you've spoken about dropout students. What is the percentage or number of dropout students here in Montrose, please? Off the top of my head, I'm not positive. Um, I think that... It's hard to say that the real number, so uh, we can get that information. But yeah. Matt can take your name and get that information. Yeah, I can get that real number. I don't want to say it if I don't know it, so absolutely. Mm -hmm, of course. And I want to mention to you, um, sir, thanks for your um, words and about the home visit. Um, one of the things that I am tasking myself with is I provide an alternative setting, but there are so many students who can benefit from some of the things we do in the traditional setting as well. And so I have working relationship with all principals um, in the district. And so one of my things is to push them as well to look at parent-teacher conferences differently and how can we do some of those home visits in our schools preventatively and not as a last resort. And so to your point, that is something I definitely want to make sure I've had conversations with the counselors at Montrose High School and the principal and said, first day of school, let's pick five. Even though it's five, let's pick five families that we're gonna go take a meal to. We're gonna go and introduce ourselves. And so I am really trying to bridge that, that it shouldn't, some of these things can work for all students. It doesn't need to be just at an alternative setting, but our traditional schools, it's harder. 1,400 students would be an insane amount of home visits, but I think we can start small, small and push that in there. Do you have any pushback from parents who don't want you coming into their homes? It's a great question. Um, <laughs> great question. Um, I'm going to say no. I believe in choice, and so we're not going to be forceful. Um, we gave everyone the choice. We did three days of home visits, and we did open our building for one day that families could come to us. So I think that you always have to give choice to families. Um, I've been doing home visits for a long time. It's been part of my personal and educational um, philosophy. I've never had a family reject it or not want it. You'd be really surprised. Um, it does some, take some tact. Um, definitely, but I think that once people can pull those walls down, I have to read my families as well, because many of them have had visits that haven't been good. And so you really have to break those boundaries as well. But once you do, it's those families who invite you in for tea, coffee, want to bring you tamales. I mean, it's, it's, it's that that happens once you break down those barriers. Thank you. Matt, you look like you want to say something. Oh, I was just going to say, um, relative to the dropout question, I know our graduation rate at least 12 months ago was around 1 or 2% higher than the state average, which would mean that our dropout rate was 1 or 2% lower than the state average. But it's an apropos question because um, any, <clears throat> local, <clears throat> any local education um, agency, which they call an LEA, that receives federal funding has to post a district uh, scorecard or a district report card. You got the number? No, I'm looking on. Oh, okay, but I'm, that is public information, and so I got an email from our office of federal programs yesterday that said, "Hey, we need to put this link to this scorecard on our website." So, like, for relatively soon by the end of the week, that'll be uh, available on our website. But all of that is public information um, that you can find via the Colorado Department of Education and also through NCSD.org. That's a good question. I know during my many years, well, one of the the problems we came up with was. Colorado's law about you only have to stay in school until you're 16. And we had so many kids and 
young families who simply left their kid in school until the day he turned 16 and they pull him out and made him go to work. So has that changed? Is there still that, that law that it's 16? There is a law, but it is now 17. Um, so there has been a little bit of work, but it has changed that you have to legally be in school until you're the age of 17. Um, in my view, I think it's more the we, we work against the workforce. I think our students, I see a lot of our students who want to work, and so they feel like they have to make the choice. Mm -hmm. At 17, they're making decent money. They're able to work and work full time and make money and get that instant gratification. And so it's really hard to stay in school and do that. I have many students, I have students who work in Telluride and they're making great money and they're 17 years old. And so I am trying to honor their worth ethic. They are hard workers. How can I honor their work and pull them in school and give them the skills for a diploma? And so how do we mar marry that a little bit for our students? So I see more of that as the challenge of we're working against, they're able to make really good money at 17 years old. And so then they feel like they have to choose. So how do we make sure that they know they can do both um, and continue on that path? Well, thank you very much. I really appreciate you both coming this morning. This has been very enlightening. Please help me thank them. <laughs> thank you for having me as well.